Amen. So Pastor Brian was talking about getting ready for Christmas and the nativity scene. I worked on staff with a children's pastor one time that his uh, mission in life in the Christmas season was to grab the wise men and move them away from uh, the, the, the nativity scene. Yeah, like we'd be going into hospitals. I'm like, hey, dude, you cannot do that, okay? This stuff does not belong to us. You'd like moved it over into a different hallway. Like they're not gonna be okay with this, but it's very funny. Grab your Bibles, open them to Ephesians chapter 5. We made it. We're officially in chapter 5. Completed chapter 4. We're, we're sticking with the theme of uh, the, the practical application. Remember, we spent many, many weeks building this theological foundation. And now Paul is going to uh, go from there and help us to uh, build a practical application of uh, what it means to live as a Christian in a lost and dying world. And so when we get to chapter 5 uh, today, we're going we're gonna to see that he continues on that theme. Remember last week we talked about the fact that we're no longer who we used to be. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that means that there was a moment in time where you came to the realization that you were a sinner and that you were separated from God and that you were in a hopeless situation and it was only through the finished work of Jesus Christ that you could have salvation, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. And when you gave your life to Christ, when salvation occurred for you in that moment, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that you are a new creation, right? So you're not a little bit different version of yourself, but you're brand new. And that's important. So we talked about that, that we're no longer who we used to be. So moving forward in Christ, we're we're brand new creations, and that means some things, right? That means that there's some things that we need to do and things that we need not to do. And Paul's going to continue to build on that idea this morning in chapter 5. Last week was more about like your personal conduct, and we'll talk a little bit about that this morning. Uh, But but I want you to think in terms of uh, more broadly how you... um, work and move and interact with the culture around you, okay? And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. As Christians, uh, we're to live counter-cultural lifestyles, right? That's what Paul is calling us to in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to cover verses 1 through 21. I know that's a lot of verses this morning, so we've got a lot of work to do, but that's where we're heading, a counter-cultural lifestyle, right? We're lived. Uh, we're called to live lives that are set apart. That's why he's going to reference the word saints so much. Remember, in our study of this and other New Testament books that Paul's written, he almost exclusively uses the word saints. He almost never uses the word Christian, and that is intentional. He wants you to know that you are different. To be called a saint means that you're holy ones or set apart ones, and that's going to come into application this morning when we talk about living counter cultural lifestyles. And you know that that can be difficult to do, right? Um, As you come to saving faith in Christ, those initial days, sometimes it's easier uh, to do that and and be totally transformed and be on fire for God in those first couple weeks, in those first couple months, right? And then over time, uh, you find yourself maybe kind of slipping back in or being confronted with some things that you had before. And it's difficult, right? There's a pressure that's put on you to conform, Right, So as you're living a life as light and darkness, the darkness wants to make you conform back to that darkness, right? And that's what Paul's going to say this morning, like, don't do that. I remember the first NFL game I had the uh, privilege of attending was here at Arrowhead Stadium, and uh, it would have probably been even uh, cooler of an experience had I been a Chiefs fan, all right? And so uh, I went into that thing as a Dallas Cowboys fan. Don't recommend it to you, but you can do it if you want. Um, one thing I learned real quickly is if you're going to go in there, go, go in there secret, you know what I mean? Like, 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 you don't have to wear red, but just don't wear whatever the other team is, right? Because there is going to be a pressure to conform uh, like you've never seen before. I go in there, I got like my OU stocking cap. I'm OU. My, my Dallas, I talk about OU so much, it just comes out. Um, my Dallas Cowboys stocking cap. And all, by the end of the game, I have no hat on. My ears are freezing cold. Aaron's like, why don't you put your hat back on? I was like, I would rather die, all right? <laughs> Then put that back on and have to live in this environment amongst these people, right? And so and there's just a pressure, right? They're all in there like, oh, they're doing their thing. And you're just like, I feel by myself here, right? And, and, and that's the truth, too, in the Christian life, right? Like we've come to saving faith. We're not who we used to be. But if we're not careful, we can have the tendency to kind of drift back or have the pressure to even conform. And so what I'm trying to tell you is I understand that it's difficult 
to maintain a countercultural lifestyle, especially over the long haul, right? To be in Christ and to live the way that God has called us to live uh, and, and to incorporate the values from this book is going to necessitate you being different, right? And, and there I even say odd. Now, you're not called to be weird. You don't have to be totally weird, but, but you will be odd, right? Because you don't have the same values and the same belief system as all of those around you. And that's what Paul is going to challenge us with here in Ephesians chapter 5. Of what does it look like to live a countercultural lifestyle and why? Why is it important that we be willing to live such a lifestyle? So before we get into the bulk of the text, let's start here. Verses 15 and 16 because he supplies for us the big idea. And he shares with us, as believers, why this is so important. Look at verse 15. Paul says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Right? When he says you, making the best use of the time, that is to redeem the time or to buy back the time. And so Paul is saying, like, listen, the days are evil you live in a culture that is darkness, right? You're called to be light in that culture. So be wise, live a countercultural lifestyle, and, and redeem the time that you have, right? So that's what the purpose is for, so that we might be light in darkness, right? So that we might be good gospel examples and gospel influence to the darkness that is around us. And so that's what we're going to be challenged with this morning. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to look at three things in these uh, verses that, that Paul challenges with his believers to live counterculture. All right? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for uh, your word to us. God, we're so grateful Lord, that, that you haven't left us here to figure out all this on our own, but God, you have supplied us with your will. As we read this text this morning, we're going to be confronted uh, with your will, God, and I pray that you would help us to conform ourselves to it. God, I pray that you would challenge us, God, where we need to be challenged. God, I pray that you would convict us if we need to be convicted of sin, God, and I pray that you would help every single one of us in here understand, God, that the most important thing that we can do this morning is learn more about you and then apply that to our lives, God. We want to be found as doers of your word and not hearers only, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, as I said, we've got lots of verses to cover this morning, so let's get uh, after it the, today. The first thing that we're going to talk about, if we're going to uh, live counter-cultural lifestyles, the first thing we need to see here is that we need to abhor evil deeds, all right? Abhor evil deeds. I know that's a fancy word to say disgust, right? So we should be disgusted or even demonstrate hatred towards evil deeds in our new life in Christ. So let's look at verses 5 or chapter 5 verses 1 through 6 and talk about it for a second. So Paul begins in chapter 5, therefore be imitators of God. So you're not who you used to be. Now you should be imitators of God as beloved children, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So the very first thing that we're challenged with is if we're going to live countercultural lifestyles, we have to abhor evil deeds, right? Like we can't bring them with us. We're not who we used to be. And in order to live the life that God's called us to live, we've got to let these things go, right? That's what he's saying. Like these are things that are improper uh, for the saints. They're things that shouldn't even be named among you is what Paul says. And he gives us a list of these things. So this list is kind of interesting to me because of some of the things that are in it. But uh, this is what Paul says, and I believe that Paul is bringing these things up because, remember, he is speaking to a particular group of people, right? These are the people in Ephesus, and they live within a particular culture, right? And for us, it sounds a lot like the culture that we live in today. So he's going to address the things that they are going to face 
on a daily basis. He's addressing the things that the culture at large, the darkness and evil around them, is going to pressure them to conform back to, right? And so he's saying, as you live for Jesus into the future, you're to live counterculturally, resist the temptation of this. These are things that shouldn't be named among the believers. So he starts with sexual immorality, right? This is physical sexual contact that he's talking about, right? This is adultery. These are things like being with prostitutes, those types of things. So sexual immorality in the physical sense. He's saying these are things that you as a believer should not practice, all right? Regardless of what you used to before, regardless of what the culture around you says, these are things that you should not practice. And so inside the church, we should be marked as different, right? That's to be counter-cultural, right? So, so we should be different in regards to these types of things, sexual immorality and all these things. So he goes on. He also says uh, impurity, all impurity, right? So this is kind of connected to the sexual immorality. While one is physical in nature, this one is all the other types of impurities, right? This is why when we talk about sexual purity, we're not just talking about physical sex, right? It, it, it's broader than that because it, it goes to your mind, it goes to your thoughts and all those things. That's what he has in mind here. He's saying, listen, don't physically engage in these activities, in Christ, and also rid your mind of these impurities as well. So things like pornography, uh, uh, lustful thoughts, things like fantasies, all of those types of things that are not God-honoring, that would make you look more like the culture at large than a follower of Christ, than a saint. He's saying, these are the things that shouldn't be named among you. Remember, you're not who you used to be. You're, you're, you're being challenged right, to live counter-culturally. So even if everyone around you is doing this, right, you're called to maintain purity because of who you are in Christ. He also mentions covetousness, right? So we go straight from sexual immorality to covetousness. Like if I was making the list of all of the things that you really, really need to watch out for, I'm not sure that I would have thought of this one, right, to put this on the list because it's not one that just automatically comes to your mind. But he tells us the answer as to why this is so important because he says it is idolatry, all right? So when he says covetousness, he's talking about uh, not just uh, wanting something that someone else has. That's, that's not the idea. This is, this is idolatry. This is wanting what other people have so much that you're willing to forsake what God's called you to do, right? Like, like you've, you've created an idol out of this thing. Like this is wanting to keep up with the Joneses so bad that it impacts who you are in Christ. That's what he said, and it's ultimately idolatry. And why is it idolatry? Because you're putting something or someone in front of God. And so he's saying, you, these are things that shouldn't even be named among you, right? And these are challenges for us. Do we not live in a culture that promotes sexual morality or impurity or covetousness, right? Like, listen, like this is what we're all about. And if we're not careful, we even kind of sink into this because of, of the broader culture around us, right? That, that pressure to conform. This is why as believers, we've got to be real careful to not fall more in love with our nation and the values of our nation than Jesus. Amen? Right? So, so there's a, a, a way in which we're proud to even be Americans, right? But do not forsake the Lord in pursuit of the American dream because that is idolatry is what he's saying. So you need to figure out which kingdom you're in and which king you've aligned yourself with. That's what he's saying. And if you're a saint, a set-apart one, if you're a holy one, then the expectation is that you have aligned yourself with King Jesus. And so these are things that shouldn't even be named among you. They're improper. They're improper for you to practice as believers, right? And he also throws in there crude talking and joking and, and, and things of that nature. But the idea here is that as a believer, you should hate these things. Like, hate them to the point where you don't practice them. That's what he's saying. That they would disgust you. That your own sin would disgust you. Right? And, and, and that's the idea here. You've now come to saving faith. You're no longer who you used to be. These are things that you can't, or you can't keep right? You can't take them with you into your relationship with Christ. And I think ultimately that's probably the broader challenge for us as believers is that we can't hold on to these things, right? 
And, and, and for a lot of us, it's, it's hard because we compartmentalize things. It's easier to justify certain things. And we come to saving faith and we go, listen, I know I'm not who I used to be. Yeah, 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 I'm a new creation, all that kind of stuff. But, but what we do is we compartmentalize, right? And we go, okay, here, here, Lord, we come to the negotiation table. Here's the list of things that I'm willing to give up now that I'm a follower of Jesus. But here's, here's the list of things that I'm gonna keep, right? And, and Paul's saying here, he's like, listen, that, that, that doesn't work like that. You're either a follower of Jesus Christ and you're a new creation or you're not. In fact, he would say, if your life is marked or continually marked by these behaviors, even if you profess Christ, you are in darkness. So if you wonder, like, am I truly born again? It's not that have you messed up and failed at one of these once. But are these still a routine practice in your life? And if so, he would say, then, then you're, you're marked by darkness, not by light. You're not light and darkness. You're just more darkness. And you can't live a countercultural lifestyle for the sake of Christ and the gospel if you look exactly like darkness. Right? So, so you should look different here. And he says it in verse 6. The real challenge, he says, do not be deceived into believing that these things can stay in your life. Listen, there was a, a predominant belief in, in the first century here that, that because of the grace of Christ, I can still do these things and I'll just, I'll just ask for forgiveness, right? I mean, the Lord is long-suffering, he's kind, he's merciful, so I'm just going to practice these things and then I'll ask God to forgive me and, and then, and then we'll, we'll be good. And, and he's actually saying here in verse 6 that, listen, don't be deceived. Don't think that those things are true. You're presuming upon the Lord. And anybody, by the way, anybody who is truly born again wouldn't presume upon the Lord in this way. You wouldn't be looking for ways to go about sinning and then just asking for forgiveness, right? Because again, you abhor evil deeds. You abhor your sin. You hate it. You're disgusted by it. And that's the challenge here. So practicing evil will not go unnoticed. And God is gracious and kind, but do not presume upon the Lord with a flippant attitude towards sin, right? That's, that's very dangerous. Just a, you're, you're lacking a healthy respect for the Lord, if, the, if that's your attitude, look at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? That's what he's saying. You're living in it. You're marked by it. You're to be light and darkness. These things shouldn't be even named among you, right? Verse 3, he says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You're to be different. You're to be light and darkness. And it starts with you hating sin and evil deeds, right? You can't keep this stuff with you. For far too many Christians, you're just, you're just carrying around pets, you just have this sin that's just there all the time. And like, listen, you got to die to that. In Christ, you're now light and darkness. You can't bring these things with you. It all starts with you rejecting the practice of sin and evil. Then he moves on, verses 7 through 14. And what he challenges us with next is this, to avoid ungodly association. Avoid ungodly associations. All right, look at verses 7 through 14. So he continues on, therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. But the major emphasis here is Paul saying, like, listen, 
You're not only to abhor evil and not practice evil yourself, you're not to partner with those that do. So he said, you're, you're not to partner with them. You're, you're to avoid ungodly association with them, right? And, and for so many Christians, I think that's the, 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 the measuring state for us is like, but I'm not, I'm not doing those things. But Paul's saying like, listen, if you're going to live counterculturally, you can't lock arms with people that do those things. Even if you're not practicing them yourself, right? You, you've still associated yourself with darkness and ungodliness. Let me give you an example we talk about this topic often, but the topic of abortion, right? How many Christians have you met or heard from that would say, listen, me personally, I would never do that. But who am I to say that, that you can't, right? And, and that's what I think Paul's talking about here. That's an association with darkness. You may not actually be practicing it, but somehow, some way, you have justified locking arms with something that goes directly against God's word. We've got to be very, very careful about those types of things in our life, that we wouldn't even partner with them on these things, that we wouldn't be associated with these things. Like, listen, sometimes as believers, it, it requires you to not just be odd, right? We, we said odd, but, but, but rooted and grounded in God's word and do it in a way that you're unashamed. This is just what it teaches and what it says, right? And that's what we see. Avoid ungodly association, before we go on, though, let's, let's talk about this because what it does not mean is that you can't have relationships with unbelievers, right? This is another thing. I feel like us as Christians, like, like, like there's no good biblical middle ground, right? It's either we go start a compound and razor wire ourselves in the thing or we're just on the other side. And, and, and we have locked arms and there's no real distinction between those of us that are believers and those of us that aren't believers. We, we, we've partnered together with them. And, and what I think the Bible is trying to get us to see is like, listen, to live counterculturally is going to have you somewhere here in the middle, right? You need to have relationships with people who don't know Christ. Listen, let me say it again. If you don't know someone who does not know Jesus, your family should be getting to know someone that doesn't know Jesus. But what Paul's going to say is you need to stop short of partnering with them in the things that they believe and the things that they do, right? The greatest example we have in this is Jesus in the New Testament. And I'll give you an example of how we get this messed up. So many people want to be quick to say, well, Jesus went to the, the, the worst of the worst, right? I think Jesus would hang out in the bars and he'd do all this stuff. He might, but he's not pulling up a chair and drinking, okay? Okay. He, he's going to where lost people are, but he's maintaining his light and darkness. He's countercultural lifestyle, and that's what he's calling us to do here. You're not called to go so far as to participate in what they believe and what they do. So we're uh, to avoid ungodly association. And then he goes on here. He says, try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. I think... I think Paul says that here, and I love that Paul says that here because how many of you have ever come into or found yourself in a situation where you're like, I, I, I don't know what to do here, right? Like, I, I don't know as a, as a Christian how I should respond or how I should act or what I should say. All those, like, like, you're gonna find yourself in that place at some point, right? And, and that's what he's saying. He's saying, discern what is pleasing to the Lord, there's a lot of things, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a lot of things that this doesn't explicitly address. It just doesn't. But I think that's why Paul says stuff like this. Like, like listen, you're going you're gonna to be put in situations where you're going to have to discern the will of the Lord here and, and, and discern what would be pleasing to him, and then you respond and act appropriately, right? And so, like, like, for an example, nothing in this book says that I can't go see a rated R movie. I mean, there's not a verse that actually says that, right? At least to not my knowledge. But I can discern what's pleasing to the Lord because of what it does say, right? And so that's what I'm talking about. We're going to be in these situations. And so in order for us to be wise, in order for us to understand how to, who, to understand what's pleasing to the Lord and how to interact and, and respond in these situations that we might find ourselves in, how do we appropriately avoid ungodly association like, like, like that's what he's saying lean into those things and and pray and seek the lord 
right? And, and be willing to be bold, to continue to be light and darkness. By the way, in, in, in the verse uh, 11, take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. He's actually not talking about lost people. He's like, listen, like when this stuff creeps in even here, like, listen, you practicing light and darkness, countercultural lifestyle, expose those unfruitful deeds, right? It's not our job to condemn a lost and dying culture. They're, they're doing exactly what dead people do. It's our job to be light in darkness, all right? And, but, but amongst us, He's saying, let, let the light of your life, let it expose darkness and unfruitful works, right? And, and be willing to be bold there. I said it, it might cause you to be in a very uncomfortable situation. I'm just trying to think, like, how many times have you been sitting there before and, like, somebody, like, is leaning into, like, gossip and you're like, I, I probably should have said something there. But I didn't. Or, or somebody recommends that you go do something that you know you shouldn't and it's like, like, what do we do here? You ever been sitting in a movie before and go, listen, I need to stand up and walk out of this thing, but I paid for it. Like, wh which one of those things are you gonna lean into? I remember when we were in Dothan, Aaron had a group of ladies that they would uh, go to the movies together and then they'd go eat dinner with and stuff. And, and one of the times in their little group chat, one of them said, there's a new movie coming out. I think it'd be so fun for all of us to go to. It's called Bad Moms. She's like, oh, here we go. Right? And you know, I think the most disheartening thing about it is that she was the only one that was willing to say like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that that sounds like something we should do together. I mean, we're, we're like women from the church. Right? Like I looked it up. That, that movie doesn't honor God. It's full of all kinds of terrible things and that's what we're talking about, avoiding ungodly association. Listen, it's easy to go after this stuff like the abortion, like that's right. But, but what about the movies you go see? What, what, what about the things that we justify a little bit easier? Are, are you going to be able to avoid ungodly association in those things? I remember when we, were in, when we were in Rogers. Now, this is two places that we've been together, and these are all church people. Like, we were at the movies with another pastor and his wife and coming out one time, and here come all the other moms out of, uh, I, I can't remember what movie. I, I want to say it was Magic Mike or something. <laughs> with their daughters. What are we doing here? We need to lean into avoiding ungodly association. It's not just, it's just all of it, right? It's what they, it's what they believe and what they practice. If we're going to live counterculturally, then there's going to be some things. And listen, when I talked about earlier, like it's going to put you in a situation to be weird and odd. Like, listen, most of you don't work in a church like I do. You work with a lot of other people. So listen, there's going to be some things that you're invited to that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to humbly bow out of. Don't lean into that nonsense that, listen, this is, if I go there, then I can be the witness. No, listen, you can still be a witness without going and participating. And that's what Paul's talking about here. If you're going to live counterculture, it starts with you abhorring sin. You're not going to practice it. You're also not going to link arms and partner with those that do, right? And then he goes on to the positive side of things, which is you're going to adopt these godly values, Okay? So if you really want to stick out in culture, if you really want to be light and darkness, there's some things you're not going to do, but there's definitely some things you are going to do that, that are equally, equally impactful, right? So look at verses 17 through 21. He goes on to say, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Listen, you want to stand out in a lost and dying world and be light and darkness? Just walk around singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs at other believers. They'll be like, what in the world is going on over there at the church? You're talking about odd. It's not going to make sense to them who, who don't know Christ. But it makes perfect sense to us in Christ. 
He goes on to say, singing and making a melody to the Lord with your heart. Verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 21, this is going to set up everything that we're going to talk about coming up. A husband's relationship with the Lord. A wife's relationship with her husband. Children's relationship with their parents. And he goes so far as to say, slaves to their masters or, or workers to their bosses, right? And, and it's set up here. It actually doesn't start with wives submit to your husband. It starts here. That everyone is called to submit to one another. Look at verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is fascinating to me. He said, listen, you want to be countercultural? You want to be light and darkness? Here's some things that you can do. Number one, be people of the word. And that will make you distinct, I promise you. Because this word is going to say that you can't go forward with things that the world around you is going to say are fine. That's being light and darkness. Be people of the word, right? Number two, be filled with the spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. That's what we talk about. Like, could you imagine just walking around your life and living in such a way that you're just sensitive to the Spirit at all times? And I love hearing stories about that when people are that sensitive to the Spirit where it's like God just prompted your heart to have a conversation or go out and, and talk to somebody or whatever it might be. But that's what he's saying. Like, you want to live counterculturally? Be people of the Word and be filled with the Spirit. Those are the things that are going to keep you from, from succumbing to the pressure to conform back to who you used to be. You're leaning into this new life. Then he says, number three, be worshipful. Be worshipful. That's what he's talking about. Singing songs. Like, listen, this is encouragement to one another. Did you know even here, coming together and lifting our voices together is an encouragement to one another? It's supposed to be. And it makes you countercultural. Listen, a lost and dying world outside of this building right now does not understand why you show up here every single week to sing praises to King Jesus. It makes no sense. Why would you do that? You could party Saturday night, you could sleep in Sunday morning, and still be up in time to watch all the football that you want today. Why in the world do you wake up early in the morning and get your kids dressed and do all the things that you do to come over here? It doesn't make sense to those that are in darkness. But to those of us in Christ, we, we know it makes sense. It's because I'm encouraged by you. And my prayer is that you're encouraged by me and we're encouraged by one another in our presence. That's why, that's why coming to corporate worship matters so much too. Listen, we're not standing at the back going, hey, listen, you missed three weeks right here on my list. We're never going to do that. But listen, for, for the sake of everyone else in this room, it's important that you show up because your presence is an encouragement. And ultimately, he says, and it's honoring to God. Like we said, the, the, the best thing about this is because of all the things you could be out doing and you're here. It's honoring to King Jesus. That's what it means to be counterculture. Four, he says, be thankful people. Remember earlier when he says covetousness? I've, that's a really hard word to say, by the way. I had to practice it a lot this week. I'm still not very good at it. But he's saying like, he, he brought that up earlier. Don't let that be named among you. And, and he's giving you the solution to that actually. Say, listen, as believers in Christ, if you'd be thankful people, you know what you won't be? Covetous people. Because you'll understand how good God is and all the things that he's given you for. And in fact, let me challenge you uh, with, with something. Go home and, and don't make a list of all the things that you want. Let's make a list of all the things that you have and be thankful for those things, Right? As Pastor Ryan said, we say it every year. It's so cliche, but it's silly that it even has to be brought up. That this is actually about Jesus. Even Christmas is about Jesus. And yes, we love giving gifts and receiving gifts, but it really is about Jesus. I love that as a culture, we celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas with the mall. It's crazy. 
But he's saying, be thankful, people. Listen, if you want to be countercultural, if you want to be light and darkness, if you, if you want to stand out as a follower of Christ, be thankful. Because again, it, it's uncommon. It's everybody else is just chasing all of this stuff. That it's, it's keeping up with the Joneses. It's, it's what we don't have. Man, he's saying, listen, as followers of Jesus, be thankful, people. And then number five, as we talk, verse 21, be submitting people. Listen, this is, this is so powerful. Of all the things on this list, you want to talk about the one thing on there that is odd in our culture is submission. It's like a dirty word to us, right? And we resist it so much. Why? Because all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, we've desired to be our own God. That's why you don't like submission. And where he's setting up, he's saying, listen, you want to be countercultural? You want to look different? Be people who submit to one another. And that's what I mean. It's setting up. It isn't just about wives. What are we talking about? He said, listen, you submit to the Lord, all of you. Which, by the way, even that's challenging. Like I said, we've, we've always wanted to be our own gods. The culture around us would look at us like, that's silly. Why would you submit to anybody for anything? You do you. And, and, and ultimately, if you have a problem, the reason why this is going to be so important in the weeks to come, when we talk about uh, husbands being the spiritual leaders, that's submission to the Lord. And it starts there, by the way. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but that's where it starts. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, submit to your parents. Workers, submit to your bosses and those in authority over you. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. Not because they deserve it, but out of reverence for Christ. Why? Because you're different. You've been called to live a countercultural kind of life, a, a life that stands out to the, the culture around you. And if you have problems with any of those forms of submission, I would say that your ultimate problem isn't really with what the Bible is asking you to do. It's just with submission in general. And the reason why that matters is because this is not a democracy. I think that's hard for us, especially as Americans, right? We're like, Lord, I don't know if you know this, but we didn't vote on this. No, there's one king. And salvation itself is not about a prayer that you prayed when you're seven. It is about submission to that one king. And that is it. And so that's what he's saying. Like, listen, you want to live counterculture, you need to look more like Christ. Christ. Right? Be imitators of God. Don't be imitators of those all around you. Listen, all they're going to do is pressure you to conform back into who you used to be, and you're not that person anymore. So don't practice these things. Abhor what is evil. Right? A -a Avoid partnering with people who don't believe what you believe and practice things that you shouldn't practice. And ultimately, adopt these godly values. If you do those things then you will be light and darkness by default. There, there's nothing you can do about it, right? You're going to stick out like a sore thumb, and that's the whole purpose. That's the whole idea, and I think maybe that's just why we don't do these things. Because heaven forbid we stick out. Like I told you at the beginning, when I'm wearing my Dallas stuff and all that, like I walked in that stadium all proud, and then like it took about 15 minutes, like I'm putting that hat in my pocket, right? Because this isn't worth it. I'm getting you know, blasted left and right. And, and oftentimes that's kind of what the Christian life may feel like for you. Is that same kind of experience. But listen, that's the whole purpose. And if you would lean into those, like, like I think so many of us are wondering, like, why we don't have more gospel opportunity? Well, it's because nobody sees anything different. We do the same things. We say the same things. We go to the same movies. We hang out the same places. We're not going to confront about anything. We lock arms and associate ourselves with things that we shouldn't. Listen, it's all about that. It's all about having gospel impact. Because going back to verse 15 and 16, he tells us in 16, make the best use of the time. Redeem it. Purchase it. 
purchase it back for Christ because the days are evil. And we're running out of opportunities, believers, to be light and darkness. Christ will return one day. And there will be no more opportunity. And I pray that that breaks your heart. And I pray that it motivates you to the point of being willing to open your mouth and share the good news of Jesus every chance you get. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for what you've done for us. God, we pray that you would continue to challenge us with these things, God. For most of us, when we came to Saving Faith, God, we had no idea how challenging it would be to be a Christian that lives in this dark world. But we know that you did. And God, you have supplied us with everything we need to be able to accomplish what you called us to accomplish. God, what it's going to require of us is to hate our own sin, to lay down things and not participate in things and partner with people who go against your word. And God, it's going to require of us to take up some of these things, God. And I pray that we wouldn't resist being different. God, that strikes up so much fear and so much anxiety in so many people's hearts. God, even in this room, God, we, we spend most of our day trying to figure out ways to just kind of blend in. And God, I pray that, that we wouldn't be that way. That we don't have to be intentionally weird, but we can be different. And God, I pray that you would take that and you would turn it into opportunities to be able to share the gospel. Because the truth is, God, that this world as much as they love these things, God, they are hopeless and broken and they know it. And so, God, I pray that that would be our opportunity as believers, that when you present it to us, we'd be able to lean into it and say, listen, you can give up doing things your own way and you can go Christ's way. And here's what it looks like. It looks like submission to King Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that you give us those opportunities and boldness to respond when you do. And we pray this in Christ's name.